Welcome to Rotary. We are a people of action committed to service above self and honoring the four-way test. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. President-elect nominee Aaron Jacobs will lead us in our opening song, America, My Country, Tis of Thee, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Steve Feldman will offer the invocation virtually and Wade Williams will introduce our visitors and guests. Thank you, President Jackie. Rotarians, please join me. My country, tis of the sweet land of liberty, of the I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Rotarians, please join me in a word of prayer. God of all people, we come before you today in recognition of the fact that there are times when human behavior makes sense only to you. The poets have suggested that our words and actions sometimes make you laugh, sometimes make you cry, and sometimes make you do both at the same time. Certainly when it comes to our politics, we are grateful when you send us someone to help us make sense of it all. Inspire our speaker today. Bless and guide his work as he strives to objectively dissect and explain our efforts to govern ourselves. Guide and bless this Rotary Club as it strives to do its part to better the lives of our members and our community, both the local one and the worldwide one. Help us to remember to start by simply saying thank you more often to those who serve and help us. Increase our capacity to innovate, to find new and exciting ways to embrace our neighbors and to make new friends and colleagues. Drive us to make this Rotary Club a source of positive change in ways that we have not yet even imagined. In your name we pray, amen. I am pleased to have the honor of introducing our guests for today's meeting. Uh, when I call your name, please stand and remain standing until President Jackie has welcomed you. Alston Albright, guest of past President Di Hershey. Evelyn Long, guest of Chuck Long. Amy Milston, guest of past president, oh, P, PDG. Dick Brown, <laughs> Laura O'Grady, guest of Brian Grimm, Lindy Puente Elke, guest of Elaine Bono, and Cora Taylor, guest of Andy Rawchick. Rawick, my apologies. There's a wee bit of difference in our height. Thank you for being here. Great to see you. I hope that you find this program to be very informative and enjoyable and that you'll plan to join us again often. Rotarians, please help me welcome our visitors and guests. Thank you. The Youth Exchange Committee had previously, previously scheduled a meeting for tomorrow at 12 o'clock via Zoom, but that meeting has since been canceled. The Charitable Grants Committee meets on February 17th at 1 p.m. via Zoom. 
The Student Education Scholarship Committee will meet on February 23rd following the club meeting in the Terrace Room. As a reminder, Courageous Conversations 2, Creating a Welcoming Culture will be held on Tuesday, March 1st at 9 a.m. and Thursday, March 3rd at 4 p.m. This conversation will focus on strategies we can take to make our club more welcoming and inclusive. To sign up, click on the Sign Up Genius link provided in the announcer, or you can contact Chris Toff. And now for our member moment. Laura Guerreri became a Rotarian because she feels that Rotary is the pulse of the community, doing important work here and around the world. Her career focuses on attracting tourists to York, and she believes it's important to be well established as a community so that tourists will want to come here. She was a member of the North York Club for several years before joining our club in 2019. She has a degree in recreation management and found her perfect job 20 years ago with the former York County Convention and Visitors Bureau, newly branded Explore York. She began as an intern and has worked in every department, becoming president of the organization in 2018, following in the footsteps of a great role model, past president Ann Druck. She has a staff of 13 who embrace the new tagline, have it made here, celebrating the rich history of York and showcasing local makers of fine goods. Laura is a proud native who lives in Dillsburg with her partner and four children. She loves to run five to 10 miles a day, often training for half marathons. She enjoys spending time with family in Cape May every summer and her extended family on their 90 acres in Western PA where they obey one simple rule, no electronics. Laura is very competitive. Her family nickname is champion of all things. When the family was on lockdown during the pandemic, they created some competitions like simulating the popular reality cooking show Chopped, where contestants create a gourmet meal using random ingredients assigned by the judges. She and her 11 year old son threw down the challenge. And an impartial panel of judges comprised of her 10, nine and six year old assigned hot sauce, Cheez-Its, chicken, and yogurt, with limited time on the clock for their culinary creations, not one to let her kids win because they're kids. She wowed the judges with her hot sauce, Cheez-Its parfait, and was declared once again champion of all things. Laura, thank you for being a champion of tourism for York County and for promoting Explore York and Rotary. And now Phil Woods with a membership announcement. As I sit next to Mike, uh, Jackie on his behalf, you look lovely as always. <laughs> one, one thing to mention about Laura also, she uh, is joining the membership committee. So look forward to doing good work together. Good afternoon. I uh, wanted to uh, give a quick announcement. We have a great presentation today, great program, so I won't take long. Uh, membership committee has been very busy over the last couple months. All thanks to you, um, Joel Tolbert, thanks to you as well. <laughs> a lot of uh, proposed members, but on, on behalf of the membership committee, thank you so much for bringing great prospective members to our committee so that we can easily approve everyone that comes across the, our tables. Um, looking back to the beginning of November, Obviously, I joke with Press President Josh about where we were. Uh, just in November, we were down to about 270 members. I'd like to let you know that we're closer to 285 currently. So we are making great progress, uh, which leads us to this march to 300. Uh, as you see with the band, uh, maybe it's homage to Chuck Long and our other uh, musical Rotarians, or maybe the student uh, musicians that we've seen in the past. But the march for 300 is just that trying to get our membership back to 300 members. Uh, it's not just to get to a number. We want to grow our club so that we can continue to do the great work the Rotary Club of York does. Uh, during, during the month of March, we ask again, as we did in November, please bring a guest, bring a prospective Rotarian. I think, um, Aaron, uh, Aaron, last week you brought a guest? And the day after you submitted a proposal form, right? I did. <laughs> I, I said, that I asked this last time I was up here, show of hands if you were proposed to this club by another Rotarian, show of hands, were you proposed? 
that's how it works. <laughs> we need you to propose new members. So again, March to 300, there is an, an incentive, of course, for every proposed member. You'll be entered in a drawing. The Revs are opening up their 2022 season uh, shortly. So we'll be giving out two $50 gift cards to use for tickets, for merch, whatever you choose. Um, so again, any proposed Rotarian during the month of March will get you entered into that drawing. And I wanted to share, um, this is all, of course, part of the Each One Bring One campaign that Rotary International has introduced. I do want to share some comments that Rotary International has shared during that campaign. Um, it, it says, members are, are our greatest asset. It's, it's the members who do the work. It's the members who contribute to the foundation. It's the members who make the impact in our local and global communities. So again, it is not just a number. It is ultimately the impact that we can do here in York. Okay. So thank you. And in closing, we look forward to marching to 300 together. Thanks. And it really helps us with some other things too, like attracting great speakers like Dr. Madonna, who will be up momentarily. Um, before we go to that, I just wanna also point out an example, a great example of service above self happened today at lunchtime with Rotarian Ron Bunce, who uh, helped a Rotarian in need who realized he was missing the back part of his name tag. And without hesitation, he removed the backing of his own and gave it to that Rotarian. I think that's just outstanding. It's just another great example of why we're really cool people. So thank you, Ron, that, that was great. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce my funny Valentine, the past president of Rotary, Mike Summers, who will introduce our program. Feeling a lot of competition from my fellow Rotarians all of a sudden. You do look very nice, Jen. <laughs> well, we just passed a one year milestone of an out of control protest that turned deadly on January 6th. And a subset of American electorate created a scene that certainly looked a whole lot like an insurrection. This was the first time in recent history, if not ever, that there was not a peaceful transition of power following an election in the United States. President Biden has now passed his first year milestone with control of both chambers of Congress, but the numbers of his majority are so razor thin that much of his agenda has been slowed, if not stopped completely. International affairs have bubbled up to the top of the country's agenda, <clears throat> excuse me, and a persistent concern of inflation is grabbing people's attention in a way that reflects back to the 70s and early 80s. We are still waiting for a new election maps shaped from the every 10 year census that's now held up in the courts. So we can get on with our May primaries so that we can decide what the midterm elections may look like and determine the future of those houses that I mentioned. We have an open seat here in Pennsylvania for the US Senate and an open governor race as well. Oh, and did I mention that there's a Supreme Court opening that is sure to get the attention of both parties' bases? To help decipher all of this is none other than our good friend, Dr. G. Terry Madonna, the former pollster, professor, and current commentator of our political world, who is a senior fellow in residence for political affairs at Millersville University. Terry will provide an analysis of the 2022 midterm elections. He'll also cover national Pennsylvania politics with an update on Pennsylvania's important open seats in the US Senate and governor election. Terry will, will provide thoughts on President Biden's standing with the voters and what impact it might have on the midterms coming up. Without doubt, Terry is one of our most frequent enjoyed presenters for the Rotary Club of York. I told Terry, I'm not sure what number this might be, but I'm thinking it's somewhere in the 20s. We've had them every year. And it's one of the favorite programs of our membership, as I mentioned. Fellow Rotarians and guests, please warmly welcome Dr. G. Terry Madonna. You're all pretty quiet out there. Good afternoon. All right. Yeah, I'm reminded perhaps as many as 20 uh, 
visits to your club. I think I was 12 when I started, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Uh, if you're confused about politics today, you're not alone. Those of us who have spent our career <clears throat> writing about, studying, and teaching about American politics are also very confused. I might point out before I take a look first at the midterm, we'll take a look at uh, President Biden's standing and some other matters. We might even get into whether we're going to have congressional elections this year. It looks like we will, but it wasn't an easy task getting there. First of all, just a couple of observations. A majority of President Trump's voters still question the 2020 presidential results in the polls. So that's another illustration of how deeply divided we are when a substantial number of voters in our country have not accepted the outcome of a presidential election. In some respects, more importantly, in recent polls, six in 10 believe that our democracy is in danger of collapse. Talking about January 6th, for example, and my 30 years of doing polls, I've never seen a question responded to in that way. How about this? 60% 6% of voters in our country think that political instability is a bigger danger than our adversaries abroad. Now, this was all done before Russia and Ukraine, but you get the point. We have never been this badly divided as a nation unless you want to go back to the pre-Civil War days. That's how, that's the extent to which we are deeply divided as a country. At any rate, the final one I want to mention is most think another January 6th is likely or somewhat likely to occur. Uh, back in the day, uh, Democrats and Republicans in legislatures and in Congress used to scream and shout at each other. That's nothing new. But then they would walk by each other and say, well, don't forget we're having dinner tonight. They actually had personal relationships. The folks I talk with who deal with Congress and the state legislature in Pennsylvania, as a certain senator probably knows better than anyone else, they just don't have that camaraderie anymore. It just doesn't, I'm not saying every single member, but it just doesn't exist. So it's hard to work out compromises, even if you have huge ideological differences, if you just don't like each other. In fact, in many respects, detest each other. And that's not uh, healthy for democracy. But anyway, I I'm gonna move on. The midterm election this year is, uh, looks like it's gonna unfold as most midterm elections have in the past. There is no doubt that particularly the first midterm after an initial election of the president is usually, re is usually referred to as the midterm curse. Translation, it's not particularly good for the president's party. And listen to this. I'm, I'm not going to get into the specific numbers, but let's just say 25 seats or more in the House. Trump, 2016, that's when he was elected. In 2018, the Republicans lost more than 25 seats in the House. Let's turn to President Obama, who was elected in 2008. In 2010, more than 25 seats were lost in the House. Let's go to 1992. Remember uh, who was elected in 1992? His name was Bill Clinton. Go, go forward two years, more than, 20, more than 25 seats in the House. I could go on. Even Ronald Reagan, elected in 1980, lost more than 25 seats in 1982. I could go on and on with this. So historically, it's just simply not been good for the president's party. Now, sometimes there are reasons, most of there are obviously reasons for it. Some might have to do with the unpopularity of a president and the difficult time that a president have, is having in his first two years. But many times it's also the economy. So let's now talk a little bit about Biden and the problems that the Democrats face. By the way, I've stood on this platform, maybe not here, but in many other places, and talked about 
Republicans having the same problem. We're just dealing right now with President Biden and the Democrats uh, and, 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 and a Democratic president. So it's not that I'm being political. I used to say when I started this talk, for the next 30 minutes or so, you're not Democrats, you're not Republicans, you're not liberals, and you're not conservatives. You have to assume the position that I have to take. Well, let's talk about this. When I checked yesterday, oh, if you have no life like I do, and you start out the morning by checking out Larry Sabato, Real Clear Politics, or the 538 blog <laughs> to get all this information, so you can do Gary Sutton's radio show every Thursday. I'm, 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 no, I'm not joking. I do it, but you get the point. So here's what we have right now. Joe Biden's job performance is about 40.6% positive. I'm going to let that sink in. You know what it was last year at this time? About 53, 54% positive. How about handling immigration? 33% positive. What about the economy? 38% positive. What about handling coronavirus? 44% positive. If we would go back the last year at this time, virtually all of these numbers were extraordinarily high. On coronavirus, it was over 60%. Literally on his overall job performance, it was 52, 53% positive. So there's been a big drop. Why is it so low? Well, the first problem that the president had was coronavirus. The second one was the Afghan pullout. And as you know, that did not exactly go well. The most the current one and the one that's most decisive in terms of President Biden's job performance is the economy. We have 7.5% inflation. And yes, we might have wage growth of 5.5, 6%, but people are still hurting as a result. I don't have to repeat, pull into a gas station and fill up the tank, you get the point, go into a grocery store, look at the increases in the price of food. By the way, you can sell your used car for more than new cars are selling for it. In some cases, that's how crazy the environment is. So we 20 million people walked out of the workforce in the last half of last year. 20 million people left the workforce. We also have supply chain problems, which have created a, a sincere and impeccably important problem with you know, obtaining the necessary supplies that obviously creates a serious problem for inflation. The Federal Reserve has not been helpful by flooding money into an environment where the goods are so limited that that's helped to expand, expand what? Expand inflation. We also, I'm gonna be honest with you, and I'll, let me say this. You can disagree with Joe Biden, but you can't dislike him. When I was, uh, before I went to Franklin and Marshall, when I was on the faculty at FNM, he was a United States Senator, as most of you know, and I had him on the campus twice. And you can disagree with him. And, and sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but you can't dislike the guy. He was born in Scranton, as most of you know, moved to Wilmington when he was 10, Still, when he campaigned in this state uh, for the presidency, he didn't stop repeating his Pennsylvania roots. And by the way, during the course of his tenure as United States Senator, he traveled repeatedly throughout, throughout the state campaigning for other Democrats. So he was, he, it, it, it was though he had never left Pennsylvania. And I'll tell you something else that helped him particularly in Philly and the Philly suburbs, because Delaware does not have public television. Guess where they get their TV from? Philadelphia, you can all shake your heads, Philadelphia. That's their primary source of television news. And because of the role he played over the years as a uh, United States Senator, as important, uh, particularly when he was on the Senate Judiciary Committee, the fact of the matter is that that gave him a huge presence in our state. One final quick story. He was very close to a guy that I'm sure many of you knew. His name is Arlen Specter. 
you know, you know this story I'm going to tell about Arlen and him? Well, uh, Joe Biden's wife and kids were in a horrific accident. His daughter and his wife died, the two sons lived. So Biden said, and this happened I, in, in December of 1972, he had been elected in November and he was to take office in January. So what's fascinating about this is that he said, I'm gonna take the oath of office, but I'm coming home every single night to be with the kids. And so guess, so he would jump on Amtrak and go down to DC. Guess who, guess who also did it? A guy named Marlon Spector. And they became like this, very, very close friends. Now, I understand that Spector had been here on occasion speaking to you all. Well, you know, he was a little different, to put it bluntly. I'm not saying that in any hurt for me, you know, or, or terrible way. He, he was just a little different. And he used to drive Pennsylvania Republicans crazy, not because, not because he changed parties, but even before that, he would get on Amtrak also from Philly to Wilmington. He and Biden became very, very close friends. They alternated as chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, but he drove Pennsylvania Republicans in another way. And here's why. He constantly referred to Joe Biden as Pennsylvania's third senator. You can imagine how Republicans <laughs> felt about that. And that, but that was, that was uh, Arlen Specter. All right, so here we go. President Biden's job performance is, is un unbelievably weak. And he has dropped support, particularly among independents, African-Americans and Hispanics. And the, the drop, particularly among Hispanics has been, uh, Hispanics, by the way, have been leaning more towards the Republican party in the last couple of election cycles. Not a majority to be sure, but you know, 40, 42% of Hispanics voting Republican now is not uncommon, is not uncommon. And Democrats uh, like Biden can get, could get 92% of the African-American vote and that's dropped by about 10, 10 or 15 points. So that's something very, very important to remember. All right, let's continue with this analysis. Do you remember a certain election in Virginia last year when a guy named Glenn Youngkin was elected uh, governor of Virginia as a Republican? That's the first time a Republican won a statewide election in the state of Virginia. I'm glad you're seated in more than 10 years. Other Republicans won statewide. You also know about Phil Murphy in New Jersey. He narrowly won by what, two, three points in a state where, where Democrats would win by 13, 14, and 15 points because it's a pretty heavily Democratic, Democratic state. Well, what happened? What happened was there was a big debate, a big debate, particularly in Virginia about teaching critical race theory. Now, I don't think there was a lot of evidence that it was widespread. I'm not saying it didn't happen at all, but here's what happened. And it also affects our state. That's why I'm, I'm bringing it up. So what we had in Virginia was a massive turnout of Republicans, independent voters, and even some Democrats who switched and voted for a Republican for governor, motivated by the relationship between in the schools between school board members on the one hand and the parents on the other. That even fell over into our state, where in some school board elections, particularly in the southeastern part of our state, that became an issue. So where I'm, what I'm getting to, and it's not just the only reason, but it's one reason. In the polls that have been done recently, Republican voters are more enthusiastic than Democratic voters are as I speak with you right now. You all with me on that? More enthusiastic. And so if that is another factor in the so-called so midterm curse, 
Now, at this point, I'm not going to tell you, for example, that the Democrats can't recover. It's going to be very, very difficult, very, very difficult. The Republicans need, depending on with all the retirements that are going on in, in, in the House, probably eight to 10 seats to take over. By the way, just this earlier in the week, the 30th Democrat, Democratic member of Congress said, I'm not seeking reelection. That's more than half of the Republicans who have said they're not seeking reelection. And so redistricting is taking place throughout the country as it is in our state. And in, most ca in more cases than not, redistricting has tended to favor Republicans, largely because the Republicans control more of the processes in the states, particularly those states that do it by having, having the state legislature uh, uh, do, do the actual redistricting. So, I'm, and in the Senate, it's 50-50 with Kamala Harris breaking the tie. It, it wouldn't strike me as anomalous. It wouldn't strike me as implausible for the Republicans to pick up control of both the House and the Senate. If that happens, give the polarization I'm talking about. If you don't believe me about the polarization and difficult times getting together, ask Governor Wolf. And with the Republicans control of the state legislature. I'm not saying they haven't worked out some deals, but you get the point. The polarization is so great. So it wouldn't, it would, wouldn't shock me at all if that were the case, that the, Demo that the Democrats lose both the House and the Senate. Now that doesn't mean that, uh, that literally that Joe Biden can't win re-election, as I pointed out, Look who won re-election after the midterm curse, right? Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, you got it. Joe Biden is, was 78 when he was elected, making him the oldest president elected in American history. He will be 82 at the end of his first term, and if he gets elected, 86. Any of you know who the youngest president elected was? John F. Kennedy. But guess what? He wasn't the youngest president to assume office. Well, how can that be? Well, a guy named Theodore Roosevelt took the presidency when his predecessor died. So he was actually younger by a couple of months than John F. Kennedy. So if Biden were to run and get reelected, and it's not certainly in the, that he, it's not certain that he will seek reelection, his aides have continued to say that he will. Although of late, there's been some walking back of that, but no president can say this early in their administration that they're not going to seek reelection. That makes them an immediate lame duck translation, no power at all. But there are a number of, uh, uh, let's say hypothetically that he decides he's not going to run on the Republican side. We got Donald J. Trump who now has a number of difficult situations. Uh, January 6th, we'll start with that and the investigations that continue, all the documents and vital papers and where they have gone, that's another debate going on. So we won't know what position he'll, he'll be in when we get to the presidential election in 2024. You have Mike Pence, who could be a candidate. Michael Pence and the president have President Trump have walked away from each other. Trump continues to insist because the vice president, the votes come in, he counts the votes or she counts the votes. And that means that the vice president cannot count them, thereby denying someone the presidency. I don't think that's what it means in the constitution and it's never occurred. We also have the Republicans have uh, uh, Chris Christie, a former governor of New Jersey, Nikki Haley, a former ambassador, UN ambassador, Ted Cruz, which most of you uh, name is familiar to you, Texas Senator, Mike Pompeo, former Secretary of State. I won't go on and on, but the Republicans could have a very, very broad field. With Biden, it could be uh, Kamala Harris, who's, by the way, whose job performance is lower than Joe Biden's lower than Joe Biden's. And the comeback kid, anybody know who that is? Hillary Clinton. 
she now has her problems with the Durham report. So if you think American politics is fun right now, you're wrong. <laughs> it's, it's insane. And it, you almost can't make this up. I, I joke about it and say, it, it's horrible for the country. It's a full employment bill for me. Because I, I have to try to I have to try to explain all of this. All right, I want to talk about a couple of other things before I get on to the Senate, and, and you'll tell me when I'm out of time, right? Senate and governor's election in our state. Number one, as of yet, let's talk about the state house and state senate. By a four to one vote, the reapportionment commission, which consists of five people, two Democratic leaders, two Republican leaders, and a fifth appointed by them if they can, if not by the Supreme Court, approved the maps four to one vote. Now, that's probably going to end up in court, given the fact that nothing gets unlitigated these days. Over in the congressional seats, and by the way, the map that was approved by the congressional, by uh, Congress would certainly make a guy, what's that guy's name? Oh, Scott Perry, how could I forget him? Much happier with the constituents that he would draw from other parts of York County. But the fact of the matter is that the, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court now has that map in front of it, in front of it. And I think they're holding some hearings this week, and I think we're likely to get a decision by next week. Typically, typically, candidates running for office would have three weeks in which to go out and file petitions to be on the ballot. When I get to the House and Senate seat races, I have never seen in all of my life as many candidates who've indicated they're going to run as we have now. If I don't have the list in front of me, I, I, can't, I can't give you the names. That's how many there are. Some of them aren't even known outside, the candidates aren't even known out of their own neighborhoods, much less running a statewide race in a huge count in a huge you know state geographically so let's set so we're probably going to have only two weeks to circulate those petitions i don't think they'll change the may 17 primary and when you think about it you given all the commercials that are underway more negative than positive you would think that the election was next month but we're in the middle of February. We got to the middle of February, the middle of March, the middle of April to the middle of May. The television stations are very happy, by the way, in the state as a result, as a result of all of this. So the point I'm, I'm trying to make here in a bigger sense is we're going to get probably get a map next week. And there's something else that's pretty interesting about this. When when the Commonwealth Court, and it was it ended up in the hands of a, of a master appointed by the Supreme Court, an, indi an individual produced a map, you would think that she had all these experts, right? And they were crafting a map on their own. No. There were at least 10 different maps circulated by all, ki by all kinds of groups. One of the maps that was finally adopted was produced by a former Lehigh County commissioner, a Republican commissioner who sent a map off. Now it was modified a bit, but it was basically that map. And so as the Supreme Court considers that they also have all of, a lot of maps, they don't have to sit down and write and do the research and do all the analysis and come up with their own map. They can pick a map that's been submitted to them and that's perfectly legal. The more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, why are we going through this complicated process if they're just going to pick a map that somebody else drew? Now, they, they modify it a bit. They tweak it. I'll put it that way. So all of that, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but that's the way it is. So I think we'll get a map next week, and uh, we'll see where that all goes. That will probably cause uh, members of some people who have indicated they're going to run Maybe they won't run. Candidate people who aren't haven't indicated they're going to run might run. You get it. You could have th that situation occurring on both sides. All right, let's turn to the Senate, uh, uh, the United States Senate. As we pointed out earlier, 
we have something that has not occurred since 1970 in this state. You know what that is? No incumbent U.S. Senator and no incumbent governor on the ballot. So they're both open seats. The U.S. Senate race, because of the 50-50, is going to be one of the, if not the most watched U.S. Senate race in the country. We were, by the way, the most visited state in the presidential election in 2020. We were the most visited state by folks, by the candidates and by folks coming in to campaign for them. That's how significant politically our state has become. It is estimated that the spending in that race will reach a record $80 million, a large share of it on television. In the six, we have a huge state geographically, a huge state geographically and demographically. And so what that trans and six media markets, put another way, six television markets, with the fourth largest market in the country in Philadelphia and smaller markets around, this is a pretty substantial market here, Lancaster, York, way out to Franklin County, up to Lebanon. It's a pretty, Dolphin County, obviously. It, it's a pretty substantial market itself with, you know, uh, TV stations with, uh, you know, na national ties, obviously, CBS, Fox, and I have to mention NBC because of Channel 8. I'll be in trouble if I don't. And any other ones. Translation, you need, you need a lot of money. And before I, uh, I'm not going to make a prediction, but if I were right now, John Fetterman, who I understand he's been here before, right? Who's one of the most fascinating characters ever to seek office. I'll leave it at that. The big debate was when he would preside over the Senate, whether he was going to wear a coat and tie because he was always seen in baggy, sh baggy shorts and T-shirts. And at, at any rate, I'll move on from that. But he's raised uh, $12 million, and he's certainly one, one of the uh, favorites. Another favorite is a guy named Connor Lamb, who's the current member of Congress from the 17th Congressional District. That's way out in the Ohio border. That's Beaver County, parts of Allegheny County. He's raised $3.8 million. The difference between Lamb and Fetterman is Fetterman is the ultimate progressive, or if you don't like that term, liberal. Whereas Lamb is more of a moderate, a moderate, even though some critics have said he's voted a lot with the progressives. But he's also in the home of the cracker plant, translation natural gas, out in the southwestern part of our state. And he supports fracking. And incidentally, a guy named Joe Biden in August of 2020 went out to Allegheny County and said, I'm for fracking. You haven't heard anything else about it. But he knew how important the votes in southwestern Pennsylvania are, where virtually all of those counties, not Allegheny, at the time, whether we're talking about Washington or Westmoreland or Green or Fayette or Cambria, are you impressed that I can name all them? had Democratic voter registrations edge, and every one of them in 2016 delivered huge majorities for Trump. Huge majorities for Trump. And so as we, we, we chat about this right now, uh, that's an extremely important element in our state's politics. We probably have, I know I digress, but that's what professors do. We have probably, several different Pennsylvanias. We have what I call rural and small town Pennsylvania. That would be, in, in some case, that would be out in the Southwest where we had coal, steel, iron, and natural gas. Up in the Northeast, the same way, uh, particularly in Lackawanna County, but other counties surrounding it, which now they also have natural gas. Those voters were working class Non college educated Democrats, beginning with the New Deal in the 1930s, they are now switching their party because they don't like several things about the Democrats now. You know what they don't like? They don't like abortion, they don't like gay marriage. 
and they don't like the emphasis on carbon emissions that the Democrats want to do, li limit them and put those old in industrial areas out of work completely, and particularly natural gas. Now, what's ironic about it is a guy you all know better than I do, I think his name is Tom Wolf, supports fracking because now he has some problem with the, you know, with, with the routes that the natural gas takes on, on its way to Philly and other places to be shipped abroad and, and the environmental damage that can occur from those pipelines. But he understands the economic significance of it. Now, I'm explaining what he would say if he were here, and maybe he has when he was here in the past. And so that's one area. The other is the big cities. Do I have to ask you about the cities in our state where they are for the most part? Now, there are some exceptions to that, but most of the Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and the third class cities are democratic now, and they are culturally pretty liberal. I won't go through all of that. The third group I would mention are, have, have remarkably turned out to be the key vote. And that might decide who wins the primary elections as well as the general election. I'm talking about the suburbs. The suburbs of Philadelphia, Bucks, Chester, Montgomery, and Delaware counties, 15 years ago were solidly Republican. Now, four of those counties, Bucks, Chester, Montgomery, and Delaware gave Joe Biden, 171,000 more votes than Hillary Clinton. So Biden wins our state by what, 80,000 votes? About less than two percentage points. You see why? And incidentally, because of what occurred in New Jersey and Virginia, and the fact that Republican voters are now more excited, enthusiastic, and Biden's job performance, Last fall, the Republicans picked up seats at the county level in all four of those counties. And if I got this right, they control, they control the county governments in all four Philadelphia counties. I live in Manheim Township in Lancaster County. It's, it's adjacent to the city. That used to be heavily Republican. I'm uh, heavily Republican. The Democrats have done very well in the last couple of election cycles last year. The Republicans took con control of the Board of Commissioners in the county. So I'm just not talking about the burbs in Philly. I'm talking about the burbs in places like Harrisburg, Lancaster, and York, where the voters there, particularly college-educated women, have turned out to be decisive in the outcome. There's a big difference. If, if you had to put me against this wall back there and said, explain the biggest difference, you know what I would say? It's between college-educated voters and non-college-educated voters, and also importantly, between college-educated women and non-college-educated women. Huge difference in terms of their party selection. And then the folks that I hang around with, the, there are 80 million of them, they're called millennials. Uh, they go up now to what, 42, 43. There are only 80 million of them in our country. They are now coming of age, meaning getting to the point where they're going to run and hold office. You got it? Hold a lot of offices. And the, they are culturally very liberal. They're, they're for you know transgender rights and gay marriage. Again, I'm using this all descriptively. I'm not getting in. You, you are entitled to your own view, obviously, on these things. I'm just making them descriptive. All right. The fourth group, you know, we sit here in South Central PA let's say that it's called the T, go up through the state. Oh, I hate to say this, the Route 80, don't ever drive on Route 80, up to the New York border and fan out across the top. Most of that area, not all, certainly not State College because of Penn State, are pretty heavily Republican. These are the more traditional rural and small town Republicans. And you know what their views are on many of these things. So we've got a very complicated state in that respect. All right, let's go back to what I was saying. So at the moment, the top three uh, Senate Democrats, John Fetterman, Connor Lamb, and Malcolm Kenyatta. I didn't mention Kenyatta before. He's an African-American state rep in Philly. He's raised about 1.5 million. Uh, we'll have to see where it all goes. And I won't, I'm not even going to name the other ones. Uh, 
There are just so many of them that they're, they're hard, hard to mention. All right, let's go to the Senate Republicans. This is fun. Imagine this. Imagine this. A television personality. I wonder who that is. Dr. Oz. A CEO of the largest hedge fund, not in the country, but in the world. No public offices for either Oz or for whom? Anybody know who I'm talking about? Dave McCormick. Let's go to a third one. Carla Sands, 40 years out in California. She was an actress before she became an ambassador to Denmark. And then last, we have a lawyer, George Bachetto, who was a boxing commissioner. So let's think about this for a minute. A hedge fund guy, a TV personality, an actress and a boxing commissioner are candidates for the United States Senate from Pennsylvania. You can't make that up. I mean, historically, what we find, and even in most cases, if you're going to run for the senator for the governorship, what, what, what have you done before? Well, you, you might have been in one of the row offices, state treasurer, auditor general, right? Attorney general. Oh, I didn't get, I'll get to the attorney general in a minute. Or you were a member of Congress or even a member of the state legislature. But how about holding no office before having lived out of the states for most of modern history out of Pennsylvania and coming back and say, oh, by the way, I want to represent Pennsylvania. So it, it, it's incredibly complicated. And I have no clue, uh, you know, that, that's pretty open. That's, they're also given the contribution, given the money that they've raised. Oz is worth about a hundred plus million so you realize what he can put in. And, and the same with Dave McCormick, who's hundreds of millions is probably an understatement about his wealth. And you've seen all these commercials. Some of them aren't friendly commercials, by the way. They're commercials attacking each other. And we're just going to have to wait and see how that turns out. All right, lastly, let's talk about the governor's race. I've never, this is truly remarkable. We have an open seat. And on the Democratic side, there's only one candidate. Only one. And that, of course, is Josh Shapiro, the attorney general, who was a member of the state house and then was a county commissioner in Montgomery County. Here's what's remarkable about Shapiro. Number one, that he is the only candidate. Number two, he is the most aggressive, best known attorney general in modern history. He has his hands in everything. And by the way, you know it if you follow him in social media, that he lets you know. And I'm not saying that in any mean-spirited way, except he has prosecuted, you'd have, you know, read the list off, it would take you two days to read the list off of the people he's, he's been a very successful attorney general and he's running unopposed. On the Republican side, we have a guy named Lou Barletta, who's a former mayor of Hazel, Hazelton and was a member of Congress. He's one of the more serious candidates. You have a guy who's from the west of here, from Franklin County, a state senator named Doug Mastriano, who's very close to President Trump. In fact, it was Mastriano who believed, as Trump did, Trump did that the, the, the election was the result, the presidential election, of widespread corruption. And Mastriano went to three different election boards in three counties, uh, York, Tioga, and Philadelphia, and wanted to get into an investigation into their voting machines and the mail-in ballots and all of that stuff. And so, and he's very, very close to Trump. We have Bill McSwain, who's a former U.S. attorney, uh, Trump appointed, and a number of other people, Jake Corman, the president pro tem of the Senate. So it's a very interesting field on a Republican side, given the large number of people. We also have a surgeon, uh, a, a surgeon, a communications person, a former mayor of Cory, Pennsylvania. Someone needs to tell me where that is. Uh, but you get the point. So we have this huge field of candidates. That's point number one. Point number two, they're going to have a huge amount of money to pour into Pennsylvania media 
outlets in the course of the next three months. I want to make one other observation. Given the fact that we might have only two weeks in which to file, which to file, that would include the state legislature as well as Congress, as well as House and Senate, two weeks. For the Senate, you need 2,000 signatures. For the governorship, you need 2,000, but 100 of them has to come from 10 different counties. So in addition to have money, you have to put together an organization. You need an organization anyway, because you want to have get out the vote uh, activities. You want a whole variety of other things. You want to be able to have street corner rallies now that we're not wearing masks and we don't have a debate over, well, some people are, masks and vaccines. I, you notice I didn't go there. Uh, there are some differences by party on that on those subjects. So the point I'm trying to make is we're going to have two of the most fascinating, unbelievable statewide elections in the Commonwealth uh, this year. Am I done? I got one minute. Oh, no, no, I didn't mean that. I meant just doing my, okay. Uh, we're out of time. No, one minute. Anybody have a question for me? Go ahead, sir. Question, what effect does mail-in voting have? Well, when mail-in voting uh, passed, what was it, 2019 in the legislature, it was passed in a bipartisan way. However, it soon became apparent in subsequent elections that the Democrats, were, uh, that more Democrats used mail-in voting than Republicans. Three out of every four Democratic voter who cast a vote for Joe Biden in the state voted by mail. Two of every three who voted for President Trump cast a vote in person. So it seems to me that, and I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be changes to you know, mail and voting. There's certainly problems that need to be corrected. Republicans, however, want uh, st uh, statewide ID. Now, the first time you vote in Pennsylvania, you need to show proof, identification. They want it every single time you must show ID. They also want matching signatures. I would joke about it and say, matching what? Go back to what my signature was like when I registered to vote 300 years ago or now. They're not even remotely the same. And Governor Wolf vetoed a bill, Act, uh, Act 77, I think, you know, not, yeah, whatever the number was, but uh, yeah, yeah. The, and, and basically he made the argument about two of them. Now I'm not suggesting that there aren't ballot harvesting and there aren't some things that need to be cleaned up, but overall, it's, I, you know, it looks like it's going to end up before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which is democratic five to two. Do I have to say anything more? about where it all ends up. I'm, I'm done. I, I should I talk too long. At any rate, thank you. It is always great to have your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Madonna. We have so much to learn from you. And I know that was just really scratching the surface of all that you really wanted to share. He's here if you have questions you'd like to ask him when we adjourn. In honor of your presentation today, you were gracious in signing the book plate for the book, The Bad Seed by Jory John, which will be no no donated to the York Academy Regional Charter School. Next week, another exciting program. Our speaker will be Rotarian JT Hand, the president and CEO of the York Water Company. For over 205 years, York Water has served the residents, businesses, and industries of York with safe, reliable water supply. In 1912, the company constructed its first reservoir, Lake Williams, and 110 years later, York Water is rehabilitating the Lake Williams Dam to prepare the company's next century of service. He'll share historical perspective on Lake Williams, the company's investment in our community's infrastructure and the responsible path York Water is pursuing to protect our most natural resource, that good York Water. 
In closing, our quote today is, the freedom to do your best means nothing unless you are willing to do your best by Colin Powell. I hope you have a great rest of your week. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>